Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. This is Unit 11, where we're going to look at developing, restoring, and managing a healthy agroecosystem. And that's basically going to take a look at our ecosystems in different ways that we can perhaps help the process to uh, have a better area in which to grow our uh, crops. Uh, here's just one example of it. it shows a farmer that he has some sheep and cattle. Um, there's that diversity of having different animals. Um, he has a pasture lands, um, the lands of where they stay when they're not out in the pasture. And just to show what, um, what you can have. <clears throat> what you're going to look at in this unit is, for a quick overview, is we're going to look at some of the perspective uh, from the perspective of the whole system instead of the individual parts. In other words, instead of just looking at the soil, the type of animals, the type of crops, we're going to look at the whole thing and how we make it um, all work together to be a better place for us to be and for having our plants and animals. Um, we're going to examine what is the diversity that might be needed uh, for a natural ecosystem as opposed to the type we've been using with the monocropping. Um, what role does diversity play in this setting if it does? And then looking at that diversity and evaluating its value to a natural ecosystem. And then how do we develop those connections uh, between sustainable diversity and stability to create one unit that all works together like it should without interference from humans? Um, the ecological disturbances and successions that we covered back in Unit 9, um, we're going to cover on them. We went into detail in those. We're going to talk a little bit about what the disturbance is, and that's when we're going in and let's say we till the land as a disturbance. Then the succession is when the ecosystem's trying to, uh, or nature is trying to make that back to what it should be so that it, it works like it should. Um, then we're going to look at the disturbance and recovery that because they're constantly occurring, how do we work with them? How do we evaluate whether it's working for us? <coughs> so ultimately whether or not we're successful. And then we're going to look at lastly at the processes involved in creating a more sustainable food production system or a farming system by reducing the effects on the disturbance that we have. In other words, what can we do to not screw up the ecosystem as much so it's doing the stuff naturally and doesn't have to work to get back to what it wants to be naturally. Um, the whole ecosystem approach, um, it's looking at that entire system like we said in the overview, we're just not going to look at one individual aspect of it, we're going to look at everything. Everything has to be looked at together and how it all works together. Um, it's just not the plants in the field, but you have to look at the entire farm, so it's just not for instance, our corn field or our wheat field or our soybean field, it's the whole everything put together. And we'll get into the details of all that. And then after we do that, um, we have to reach out from just the farm we're at to farms around us. Because if we get that ecosystem working on ours, we have to make sure it's working in the ones around us. Also, because if it's not, it's going to come in and start affecting us if they aren't doing what they should be doing, the farms around us. And then all those other farms are going to look, um, when we start getting them to work right and then having a natural ecosystem, we have to form an ecosystem of a region. So we get, for instance, a state or a portion of a state or a, just a specific area that may be uh, in the valley between two mountain ranges, those types of things. And then once we get that all to happen and coalesce together, <clears throat> then we're going to have to get one entire form, an entire area, let's say the entire state, the entire western part of the states of the United States, the entire United States, that type of a thing. Um, we have learned that the whole is more important than the sum of its parts, and you've heard that in lots of things, and it's true. Um, looking at the current practices and beliefs, um, pretty much we're looking at what crop yields we get and the dollars we make, and that's actually trumping how the ecology of that area is performing. In other words, farmers are going to be more concerned with how many dollars they make as opposed to how great the ecology is at this point. Um, what we're beginning to understand is that's an extremely narrow view. And I guess I should also say 
that it's not just farmers. It's been pushed that way from the companies that produce the grain, the lobbies that are, are farming lobbies for all the different companies that are um, using the crops out of there. The government's even played a role in, hey, this is the way we should do it. Um, now we're starting to say that it's kind of a narrow view. We need to expand that out a little bit and, and learn from what we've done to make uh, an area more sustainable and ecology more workable and more natural. Um, what we need to begin our understanding um, that the food system that we have certainly depends on all the individual farms that are out there. Um, the uh, individual farms depend on our agroecosystems. In other words, that the natural area that we're in, um, that it's going to affect what that is. What we do on our farm is going to affect that. And then agrosystems rely on other agrosystems. So that region thing we're talking about, it's this area and that area, and we have to go together to work together to get one agroecosystem, especially if they're in differing type and they're. Uh, they're kind of working against each other. And then the ability to live and prosper is going to depend on uh, our natural ecosystems to survive and thrive. In other words, it's going to become more important to make sure we're natural for that to happen. Um, also, looking at this, that we're you're looking at the whole system instead of the individual parts, we'll look at how do you manage that. You're going to have to manage the parts so it works as a whole, okay? But we're going to try to get it so that we can manage it so we're working less to make that happen. We aren't trying to control things. We're letting them naturally happen. Uh, in order to do that, it's believed that we have to create fewer disturbances. In other words, don't disturb the land as much. Um, don't let the animals eat away too much of a pasture land and move them around. We'll see some of the, the, the uh, ways that we can do that. I'm giving you a couple examples here. And then um, fewer successions or recoveries. In other words, it's just like if you slip and fall and break your arm. Um, if you do that enough times, it might be it takes longer every time after that to heal because it's been broken before. So it's that type of thing. We're trying to create fewer of those things so we don't have to worry about those recoveries. Because there's a point at which if you had to go into surgery, you can your body can handle it so many times before it might kick back and say, hey, I can't do it anymore. So it's those types of things we want to try to keep those, what they call successions in agriculture or in the ecosystems down. And then um, everything that we knew, we need to look at and see, hey, does it have an impact on the whole system? Because sometimes um, we believed it never did, and we're beginning to see now that some of the stuff we thought we had no effect on, we tremendously affected what's happening. Um, here's a chart just looking at the dynamics of a diverse agroecosystem. And on top, you're looking at, okay, if you had a farm that was diverse, what types of things could you do that would make it diverse? And we're going to get into the details of some of the stuff, but intercropping is where you're planting uh, more than one crop in the same area. We talked about that before, like planting corn and beans together, that type of thing. Hedgerows, which is going to help with wind blocks, but it's also going to bring wildlife into the area, which also will get rid of some of the uh, insects that aren't, uh, they're harmful insects that you have that might be wiping out a crop or at least uh, detrimental to what you're going to produce for a great yield. Um, greenways are what they learned instead of trying to plant a whole area in a hilly area, the greenway allows for um, the water to be held there longer because the grass roots are helping aerate the lawn or the lawn, the air, the field. And the, in turn, what that's allowing happen is there's going to be more uh, animals in the area that will help the whole thing. Um, and it's also going to keep the water from running off like it used to. Um, natural buffers could be things like trees. Uh, it could be an area where the land isn't uh, very fertile, maybe it's too rocky, that type of thing, and you could put trees in there that would certainly grow in that area and you create a buffer from one area to the next that might keep the, as much sun out of an area, it might keep the wind from coming through, for, so if we're using those trees. Um, some of the stuff, crop rotations, um, we talked about that in prior units, in fact I believe the second unit we talked about it, and that's basically where you don't use monocropping, which is the same crops every year. It's every third year you put in a crop that's going to give us um, natural nutrition for building the soil that we have. Um, natural weeds, um, 
you're not, a lot of times when we're wiping out stuff with herbicides, we're actually creating different weeds that wouldn't necessarily be there because you killed out what was there. So you have a change for that. And then um, pasturing animals, when we found out that, that pasturing of animals was a good thing so that the uh, ground would be naturally fertilized when uh, the animals are out there. So that's very helpful. And plus they're eating better food and it's better meat that we're going to be eating, less fat in it. Um, and then there's biotic and, and abiotic diversity additions and additions are the things that you can do to make stuff better in an ecosystem. Um, some of the stuff, if you do the diversity that's listed in the green, the darker green or lighter green, excuse me, on the top, um, you're going to add nitrogen to the soil. If we do the pasturing, we're going to have the animals helping control some of the weeds because they'll be eating them. And then there's going to be allelopathic weeds and what allelopath allelopathy is basically where there's some chemical condition that exists within a plant that it either helps or it hurts um, things that are around it. So an example of that uh, could be if you have a black walnut tree growing, nothing grows under it because the black walnut tree secretes a biotic chemical that says, I don't want anything else here, you're all going to die and nothing will grow around it, or not very much will grow around it. So the biotic things are the living things, the abiotic are the non-living things. So what basically it's talking about there is the soil biota would increase. Now biota is uh, living things, but basically what it means is for all those nutrients that are in the soil, because they're going to be in the right portion in the, in the correct amounts, that's going to make that soil better and it's going to release some of the nutrients that are in it and allow the plants to use them. So even though it's on the abiotic side, it's just saying because the biota is increasing, in other words, those, those beneficial um, insects that will become in there or organisms, it would help make better soil for us. And then you're going to start getting some naturally emerging results. We aren't forcing things to happen. So you're going to have more efficient use of energy. If you don't do things like tilling, you're going, to, you're going to use less fossil fuel, so that could help. If you're going to let the animals try to control the weeds a little bit more naturally, you might not be putting uh, herbicides and pesticides on. Um, you're going to have a more stable ecosystem because you're not trying to force something to happen. Because if you force one thing, another thing is going to change what's in it. So we're trying to make it natural, which will be better. Um, there's less risks to the farmers. You aren't putting on all the herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers. And then because everything's becoming more natural, that you're going to have interferences. There's always interferences or changes, things that try to disrupt stuff. But it's going to be things that are natural so that you won't have a problem. It's, it's not going to give you a, a bad in interference. It's going to give you a positive interference. Um, one of the things we're also learning is that we made huge mistakes in trying to control um, pests that we have as opposed to eradicate them. In other words, we're going to create an environment that you aren't going to get rid of all the pests, but you're going to get rid of enough of them so they aren't going to have a horribly adverse effect on your crop, the, the amount of crop you're going to be able to produce and, and sell. Um, Obviously, the, the chemicals that we've, we've had, they have wiped out stuff, but because you wiped out one, it might have made a beneficial insect that helped on other stuff go away because whatever chemical you put on killed whatever it liked the most. And then they're, they're like, hey, I'm not going to stay here. I don't like this neighborhood. I'm going to move to a new one. And that's what they do. So they move to that next agroecosystem. It might be farm or two over, but that's what the uh, insects do. On some of the pests, so some of the beneficial things aren't real good. We found out aren't real good to, to lose. Um, increasingly, we have seen that we're trying to control as opposed to eradicate, so that we'll have some there, but we keep it at a point where, let's say, maybe you could have, uh, if you had a million bugs there that were uh, eating on your crop and ruining the the leaves or eating the flowers off of your um, plants. If you could get it down to, say, 100,000, and I'm just throwing out numbers, it's not a set amount, it would depend on what type of uh, pest you had, 
but basically what it would do is control it to a point where, hey, the, the, the plant's still going to grow and produce stuff. You might lose a little bit, but you're not going to lose most of your production. Um, in terms of removing stuff using pesticides, here, here's just one example of a pesticide that could be used, and it's a synthetic pesticide. Here's another way you can control things. You could get a ladybird, a, a lady, we always call them ladybugs, um, and uh, they'll eat the aphids. So if you have aphids, you can control it with the, the chemical that was on the prior slide, or you can get ladybugs and let them go, and then they're going to be good for the environment. They're going to hurt anything. They're going to get rid of your aphids, so you're not going to have a problem. There's much of a problem. Um, when you look at it, you have to look at everything in your ecosystem and how do I develop this plan to do it. So you need to look at you know the, the disturbances and successions that you have and how you can maybe try to control that. So you have to look at what kind of sun you have, how much moisture you have, do you have trees, do you have grassways, um, how, what's the biota of the soil like, um, is there water close? Is it usable? Can it come up? Are the nutrients at the level they need to? So you need to look at all those things and try to develop a plan. And sometimes it's going to be trial and error and hit and miss in terms of getting that to work. But basically what the belief is is that if you build something that's more diverse, it'll be more complex. Generally, the more complex it is, the more interactions you're going to have, the more diversity it creates, and you're going, to inter you're going to increase the amount of beneficial interactions that happen. It's just how nature happens to work. Here's an example. We talked about um, using grazing, that you can provide the, um, some fertilizer from the waste from the animals. Um, here is an intensive grazing system, and then basically they've been on the left side of the fence there, for about three weeks, and very soon they'll move them to the other side. If you look, the grass is higher over here. They pretty much eat most of that off, okay, or at least down to the level. You don't want them to get all the way to the ground, but you want enough so they can eat. And then once it gets too much, you move them to the other side of that fence, and then they start eating that, so you just move them around. So you're moving the fertilizer, you're not going to get too much in one area, and it works out beautifully. And then how do we start to begin once we start that process? How do we start building on that to make it better and better? You're going to be constantly evaluating it. But one way is if you have more plant varieties in an area, you have more of a possibility to have a better diversity out there. Uh, also, if you integrate livestock within the crop areas, and a lot of times what that will be is it's not during the, the growing season. It's going to be after the growing season, and they'll um, – a lot of farmers got rid of the fences they had so that they could grow two, three more rows of crops, therefore making more money. Well, now they're starting to put in the, the barbed wire fences again, and they're letting the animals go out there after the crop's done. And what that allows is the animals will find the uh, leftover grain. It's not 100% that everything that grows is harvested. Some of it falls out of the machine. Some of it falls over. So the, so the whatever animal you have grazing in that field will go out there and get that grain there and it will not be growing next year so there'll be you know less of uh, interference from crops that shouldn't be in a field that uh, farmers have to worry about getting out. Um, and when you're doing that, of course, it's going to result in more beneficial insects and organisms in an area. Thus, you're going to improve the, what the soil is like, the biota. In other words, the organisms that are in there are going to be better. So you're going to have a healthier, more vigorous, better growing plant because of that. Um, when you reach a good level of diversity, pretty much you can start getting rid of some of those external inputs like the pesticides, the fertilizers. Um, tilling, those types of things, because it'll. So if you start doing some of those crop rotations and things like that, then you're going to be able to um, have have a better farm area, and you're going to produce better crops. Um, pest management is going to be controlled by the farmer, and that's a big word. Controlled, not you aren't going to eradicate pests. Uh, you're going to make them at a manageable level. Um, and part of the problem you have, I'm, I'm not sure if I really directly mentioned this, but part of the problem with pest management using synthetic um, ways, methods, you it it's very expensive. So if you just control them and can get a good crop, 
it's a lot cheaper, therefore it's favorable by most people who are farming that want to use that. Um, the nutrient cycling is going to be done by animals and the cover crops that you put in. So if the animals are out in the uh, pastures that you move around your farm and don't have them in the same area, you're going to be, the animal waste is going to help you out a little bit there. And then you're also going to be aided by cover crops in between your crop seasons. You put in a cover crop that keeps the uh, soil from being blown away and it also puts nitrogen in the soil so that's going to help you too. Um, and also plant matter that's not consumable by humans is eaten by animals and then because they're eating the animals it's nutrition to them. So for example in a cornfield the cows will go in there, one of the animals that will, they'll go in and eat the rest of the stalks that are there and that will be cleaning that out. They use that for nutrition to grow, they create meat. We slaughter the cows, we eat the meat, lo, well, lo and behold, we couldn't use that plant matter, but we're now using it for um, the feed of animals. They're also using it um, by baling it, like they used to ha uh, bale hay and use it for food. They're all now taking the corn shucks and using that also. Um, some of the alternative uh, pest management practices that you can do. You can use cover crops or grasses like alfalfa or wheat. Uh, it creates winter cover and puts the additional nutrients in the soil. So by doing that you uh, have better soil biota that could help get rid of some of the pests you have. Intercropping with numerous different crops you can use. Uh, it, because you're putting different things in there, uh, at the same time, it's bringing different insects into the area, and that help, helps introduce plants um, that can ex assist in existing crops. In other words, what you're doing is by putting more than one crop in the same area, planting more than one thing in the same area, that you're actually putting a diversity there that's going to help perhaps uh, the insects that come in are going to help the existing crop that was there before the second one was put in. Um, border plants, um, you can use that. Hedgerows are kind of being used uh, in for that purpose. You can get beneficial insects also. Um, a parasitic wasp is an example of it's not really a wasp, but it's a, it's a, they call it a wasp, but what it does is it helps um, get rid of some of the pest issues that you have. Um, also, many pests, it's not just one pest. And then there's flowering corridors where people didn't really consider on a farm using flowers, but there's many um, places you can use flowers that could bring beneficial insects for the rest of your plants. But a big area where this could really help is in vineyards. They found out by putting flowers in vineyards, it helps control a lot of the pests you have. Um, when we're looking at ecological diversity, um, the natural ecosystem, and that's a area around our, let's say a farm could be an ecosystem, we want to make sure it occurs naturally. In other words, we aren't doing something synthetic or doing the least of human interference to make that ecosystem work. We're letting it happen itself. Um, by creating different plants combinations that are in that area, um, you're going to have a more productive uh, area. The habitat will be better and you'll end up with a diversity that keeps getting more and more and more as time goes on. Um, when we're trying to figure this out, it's probably best to try to do it in an isolated area. You pick one area and you take that and you try to make it better in that area and then you just keep going out into other areas once you learn something about if there's a specific practice that you could do that might help neighboring farmers you might try it, they might try something else. If you get stuff that works, you can then interchange that information and help each other um, and go into more than one area. Um, scientists have kind of developed for natural ecosystems, there's three diversity types that are out there. Um, here again, it's just to give you some basic information. Um, there's alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, it, could be, it could have been called A, B, and C for all we care about, but basically an alpha, they just said, okay, these are naturalist ecosystems that they have a variety of species and it's in a really small area or a community. It's not widespread. Um, beta means it's something that is growing across more than one habitat, so it might be, you know, 
between your community and one ten miles away, that type of thing. And then there's gamma, which are just species that are, are diverse within a specific area, let's say a state. It could be a mountain range, it could be a river valley, it could be a state, it could be the U.S. has it and South America doesn't, that type of thing. Um, ecosystems we, we are finding can really easily adapt to the first two. The third one becomes a little bit harder because you have different environments. The weather environments, the weather patterns are different. So, and the growing conditions are different in a mountain range as opposed to a valley. For instance, uh, you can grow grapes and generally uh, the best grape growing areas are in valleys. You really can't grow them very well on a mountain range just because of the difference in what the conditions are. Um, talking about successional processes and diversity changes, and if you recall, successional processes are those changes that are made by the ecosystem to try to recover from the disturbances that you did. Um, it happens automatically. You don't have to try to do it. The ecosystem will try its best to do that. Um, trying to get back to what it was because that's what it liked before that disturbance happened. And then it's possible that you get to the right level with what we're doing, but really with the monocropping, how we do it, we found it isn't a very good way because, for instance, with growing of corn, which they'll grow up for three or four years and then maybe switch to soybeans for a year, corn really takes the nitrogen out of the soil, so you're continually having to add that. So that's what that monocropping was. Um, a greater level of diversity is certainly going to have help you have greater resistance to changes that are going to occur, and that allows for more stability. In other words, that you might go in there and, and till um, after a crop comes out, and you're cutting some of that crop into the ground, so you're disturbing the ground. Um, that could affect how stuff grows, how the wind moves the things and that, but if you <coughs> start doing it, things on a regular basis, with some of these varying things like multiple plants and that, putting in the cover crop, you might find out that it doesn't affect it as much and it can recover sooner because you're doing the same thing and it got used to what it is you were doing. Um, but that's in a natural basis, not on a synthetic basis. Um, only issue with it is not everyone agrees on how the two systems interact, therefore what's the best thing to do. So what might work in one area might not necessarily work in another area. But what you need to find out for your area is how do you make it stable and you just work in, you know, in terms of doing that way. But what really should be there for a natural ecosystem is that you're able to maintain complex interactions or really the system's able to maintain it because you're not interfering and allowing it to happen and it should be able to self-regulate. If you think you have something that's working right but it seems to work and then it doesn't, it's not really probably something that's as natural or as good as you thought it was. It certainly isn't self-regulating. Um, disturbances um, happening regularly usually become more intense. They can be more difficult to maintain because you have too much frequency. If you tried to um, till it before you planted, then you planted, then you were trying to go in there and get the weeds out of it, um, then you uh, went in there and harvested the crop, then you went in there and disc it, then you went in there and plowed it, then you went in and disc it again, then you put in a cover crop, you're probably going to modify it so much and disturb it so much it's going to have a hard time recovering in that year period because there's just too much of that. So in other words, the less human action, the uh, less human interaction there is, probably the better the progression is going to be. Um, but that's what you have to try different things and see how they work, and certainly do research. Um, here's an example of Milo, which is happens to be a crop that they're putting something in in California where they might have two seasons of, let's say, growing tomatoes and cucumbers, and then they put milo in as a third crop. And they have enough because it's nice all year round. They can do that, but the milo is putting fertilizer back into um, the field. So that's, you know, a, basically a cover crop type crop. But they can also get uh, something out of it, just like if you had wheat or 
alfalfa, you get some product out of it. Some cover crops you don't. Um, what's the value to diversity if you use multiple cropping in an agroecosystem? Um, and we're gonna what we're gonna do is show you how multiple crops is important to it and how it can help. Um, how does it create that diversity if you're in a micro habitat? In other words, a small area that doesn't have it isn't a widespread region. Um, it might be that every crop has its own unique environment. And then we're also going to look at the the use of uh, limits to the diversity. Um, so you don't the farmer isn't risking things that he shouldn't be taking risk he shouldn't make. Um, because environmental conditions are going to affect one crop, but might not bother other crops in the specific area that you are. So that's a diversity thing. We're trying to figure out how it works in your area <coughs> in the best fashion um, with multiple cropping. And that could vary with each area. Um, it also shows multiple cropping uh, is important because <coughs> if you increase that diversity, it creates new interferences and because of that it's a good chance it's going to increase the, how sustainable something is. Uh, a good example of that is using nitrogen fixing legumes and similar crops, um, alfalfa, wheat, rye, those types of crops. And then uh, creating an environment that's conducive to bringing in the beneficial predators, parasites, or contaminants that might be there that keep other things out, but doesn't affect the crop that you'll be growing. And in other words, the ecosystem's gonna function naturally using what's there and not having a problem because the stuff came back because you created an environment that it likes. Uh, pretty much, if you introduce animals, you're gonna have better nutrient cycling because they're eating part of the stuff and then putting their waste in there, so that leaves some stuff. So it adds a number of beneficial insects by that, the animals coming there and being in a pasture and um, leaving their waste. Um, here's an example of grass that will help protect um, some cropland um, because it's, it's, it might be hard to see in this picture, but you can kind of see, whenever you see uh, crops grown like this, where they started planting them, and actually the crop is cleaned out of here, but you can see where it was. Um, you can go down here and you can see how it curves around. That's where it's going downhill. And then they do straight at the bottom in the valley, but this is the hilly area. They can't just plant straight because when the water, well, first of all, you have all this grassland that's keeping the water uh, contained in certain areas and not allowing it just to wash out the soil. And that's what they learned uh, with that. So that's what that picture is showing. Um, but increasing diversity, we talked about all these things, but just to recap some of those things, the intercropping, which is growing two crops in the same area, uh, hedgerows and buffer zones. The hedgerows were the areas where wildlife could be, but it's usually bushes. It could be small trees. It could be huge trees too. Um, and then buffer zones is just an area, it might be a forested area that had a lot of trees that just, or it's a rocky area that wouldn't be good to grow stuff in. Uh, strip cropping is where you do different crops in different, like you put two row, or three rows of corn, two rows of wheat, that type of thing. That's strip cropping. Cover crops is where you, once the crop's out for the season, let's say in the Midwest where you only grow one crop a year, you put in wheat or rye or alfalfa or some cover crop like that to let it put the nutrients, the nitrogen back into the soil fallows, which means you don't do anything, you just let the land rest. And sometimes that's uh, something that's good for allowing that to rest also, or to, to become better soil. Um, the no-till or reduced till, and then by rotating crops, by putting different crops in, if you're putting corn in all the time, it's using your nitrogen. It isn't with the other crops. Um, how you can increase the diversity is reducing those chemical inputs and the pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers you use less of. If you're getting better soil, you're going to be able to use less. It's going to need less. If you're using the cover crops, it's going to help you not need as many of those. Um, human interventions, bringing the animals in and pasturing, um, increasing the organic inputs by possibly putting compost. If you're leaving the residue of the crops on the field, that's one way to get some compost. You can actually bring in compost too, more probably for a smaller area, not a huge area. Um, the cover crops, because you're gonna put those in there, generally a lot of cover crops, they till them in the next spring. 
Um, and then to increase the diversity, of course, if you have more crops, you are going to become more diverse. Um, diverse stability and sustainability. If you have increased diversity, you're going to have more positive interference leads and you're going to have more interactions with crop and non-crop elements. In other words, that natural system is going to start working for you if you have more plants and animals that are there. And how can these gains be used to our advantage? Well, that's a very good question to, to think about. Um, research is beginning to show that if you do a mosaic or scattered pattern uh, in order to try to create that structure for an ecosystem, in other words, you mix annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and animals. In other words, you just don't do annuals and, and trees and the crops. You mix different things together. The more you mix or scatter it in different places on your farm, the better that that agroecosystem is going to become. That ecosystem will become a better ecosystem. Um, and here's a list of all of our attributions, all the pictures and charts that we had in this unit.